so tickled to be here. I can't even tell y'all how happy I am. I fell pretty hard for hope when I first got to be with y'all, and I have so much respect for Pastor Daniel, and um, I love Pastor Jackie. I don't love standing next to her because she does not run to carbs when she's stressed. I do. And so, so I, could, I could fit her whole waist in my sock, which is kind of hard. Um, let me get y'all to stand up. My name is Lisa. I am not, I'm not Lisa Bevere. She preaches in leather pants. I can't do that or y'all would be scarred. And I'm not Lisa Bevere. She te- I mean, Lisa Turker. She sells a lot of books. I'm just the regular Lisa in the middle and I'm a spitter. So this is gonna be Baptism Row this morning. Turn in that direction because I know y'all are disappointed that Daniel's not preaching. So you're getting a massage in church today. Turn in that direction and rub on that saint in front of you. Unless you're coughing. Oh, quit being sissies, gentlemen. You're just touching their shoulders. All right, now just in case you're on an end or you have a wimpy rubber, turn in that direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, before you sit down, find at least one unfamiliar face. You don't have to grope them. Just introduce yourself. That's awesome. Now, y'all can be seated. We're going to be looking at John's gospel this morning, but before we go there, I want to tell you just a quick story. Um, I'm still getting, it's probably my spanks that are messing up this microphone. Um, gentlemen, do y'all want me to use a handheld? I'm, I'm going to bug them with all my, do y'all hear a lot of popping? You don't? Okay, good, because I'd rather be able to have both my hands. I keep hearing it, but I think it's my spanks. Um, <laughs> I, I love the house of God and I love the word of God, but I always want to bring a qualification when I get to be a guest in a house that I respect like hope and let y'all know that I am a hot mess waiting to happen, that um, I don't have it all together and I don't always say words in the Bible in traffic um, or when I sweat in Houston's humidity. And, and I say that not as a way to qualify sin. If sin was no big deal, Jesus could have just done detention. I say that by way of, of just praising God for his goodness and his mercy and his grace. I know you've been in a series of about momentum. Uh, listen, Pastor Daniel pastors me vicariously, even though I'm in Tennessee, because I watch y'all online. And I've loved the series on momentum and where I take great encouragement. And if you shoot a picture of me from the waist down, I'm gonna punch you in the throat. But um, not really, I'm teasing. But use a filter, use a really good filter. Um, But where I I take great comfort is that our momentum is not based on our character or our capacity. It's based on God's compassion. Because my gut says, some of you might think, well, I don't have quite as much momentum as he or she does because they've been walking with the Lord for longer. They don't have quite as colorful a BC chapter in their story. And so I'm gonna be a little slower and I wanna encourage you that that's not even biblically defensible. If you study scripture from cover to cover, and by the way, y'all, if you're new to hope or new to God's word, sometimes in church circles, this is used as a club to beat people over the head. That was never God's purpose. From cover to cover, and this is true in the Old Testament, because we tend to think of the Old Testament as painting God as a unibrowed, angry librarian just waiting to smack us over the head with a rod if we get out of line. And the New Testament is Jesus with hair extensions hugging lepers. Um, And that's not actually how God describes himself. From the very beginning, he says, I'm an us Uh, I am God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Jesus didn't just come on the scene in the New Testament. Holy Spirit didn't just show up in Acts chapter two. They've been there since the very beginning. We are loved, created, adored, redeemed by a Trinitarian God. St. Augustine, old smart guy, says only the Christian God is a perfect community unto himself. He's designed us to 
operate in community. 96% of the biblical imperatives, that's just the here's how I want you to walk, are done in the context of community. We were always meant to do this together. And so our tendency is to isolate. Our tendency is to go, oh, he or she runs faster than me. They have more spiritual momentum than I do. That's not biblically defensible. As a matter of fact, I think to encourage all of us, much like, like Pastor Daniel did for me last week, Jesus put story after story in here of people who didn't have it all together. The great leaders in God's word, half of them were yahoos, y'all. They were people who had a lot of blooper reels on their story too. As a matter of fact, I said we were gonna be in John. Well, I'll stay in John. We'll go, we'll go to Mark next. Are y'all okay to stay in John? Yes. I love the gospels. I, do, I love the gospels, but I love the Old Testament too. And I love Song of Solomon because Song of Solomon is like Daniel Steele in the Old Testament. Wherever I'm in, I just, I love God's word because it's a love story. It's about us and him. If you think the Bible's boring, oh, honey, We've got boring Bible teachers. Not all of them, but some of them. And we've got some boring curriculums. God's word is anything but boring. This is better than pay-per-view. I was was at a church not too long ago in Michigan. And I got to the airport and they told us when we got to the airport that it was likely that my flight, I was flying from Grand Rapids to Chicago to Nashville, it was not likely that the flight from Grand Rapids to Chicago wasn't gonna leave because there was ice. And I should confess to y'all that besides the fact that I'm a blooper reel wait, waiting to happen, I'm also a very jaded frequent flyer. I am 58, which means I get discounts at McDonald's. And since I was 22, I've been traveling on planes. So except during that season of COVID, I usually have about 150 flights a year. And I don't know if y'all flown recently, but they have reconfigured the width of airline seats to exactly the size of Giselle's behind. And so it's increasingly uncomfortable to fly and flights are oversold. So when they told us, we're gonna cram you on this aluminum tube called a plane, but you probably are not gonna go to Chicago, I felt something well up in me that was not spiritual. The, the, the momentum was going nowhere fast, pastor. But I thought, okay, I'm just, I'm just going to pray. I'm just going to be positive. I'm going to get on the plane. I'm just going to focus on the Lord. I'm going to put my earbuds in and I'm going to listen to a little bit of Megan Trainer, who I know is not worship, but puts me in a good mood. And I'm just going to try to do everything I can to just keep my momentum moving towards something that's remotely redemptive. And so we're on the plane, midget plane, you know, one row on that side, two rows on this side, crammed plane. I'm thinking, why did they board us when we probably are not going to take off? And you know, when you're just jonesing to get home, just jonesing to get home and there's something in your way. So it's not just your momentum is slow. Somebody traps you. You can't go faster. So I'm sitting there and I'm trying to be real positive. I'm thinking if I wasn't, so I was raised Baptist. My mom is Baptist. My dad's Pentecostal. So I'm Baptistical. I'm I thought if, if there was no Baptist in me, I would so order an umbrella drink right now, but I won't. I'll focus on Pastor Daniel's sermon and on good things. And, and then I look up because they had told us they were closing the boarding door, but they let one last person on the plane. And I look up and I thought, bet you 50 bucks she sits next to me. I could just tell because I could tell even as she boarded the plane that she was a talker. And I love to talk, but not on planes. On planes, it's like, don't be talking to me up on the plane. I don't want to see your children. I'm not going to share the four spiritual laws. I just want, this is my, this is my spot. I was flying to Texas, not this trip, but a few months ago. And the man next to me on a Southwest flight stole my leg hole. Have y'all ever had that happen? I feel like I have a tattoo on my forehead that says, please, if you're a large man with very bad hygiene, sit next to me and take my armrest. I would love you. Well, this time the man does all that, but then he shoved his like in my hole, in, in the hole. I was like, I paid for that hole. That's for my purse. Can't believe your hole. I just couldn't even believe it. I mean, it was worse than knee harmony match. I just <laughs> didn't even know him, didn't know his name anyway. That, that's neither here nor there. This flight was two, two rows. I'm on that row, one row. This lady gets on. I can tell she's a talker. And then she was inadvertently whacking people with her bags as she walked down the aisle because she was elderly and she was a little bit discombobulated and she was kind of looking to see where she was sitting. And I thought, I can just tell, I can just tell. She's sitting next to me. Well, she walks up to me and she went, is that 12C? 
And y'all, I wanted to lie so bad. But I thought it's lit over my head. I have to tell the truth. And I said, yes, ma'am, this 12th seed. She said, well, I'm sitting next to you. And I was like, yay. And so I helped get her bags in the overhead. She gets settled and I smile. And then I did the universal, we're not talking anymore. I put my earbuds in. I got out my deep theological journal. If I'm not studying something for seminary, this is how deep I am. It's either People Magazine or the Pottery Barn catalog. So I got out one of those. I know people's trashy, but I just, I love it so much on planes. So it's just to stay current with pop culture, Pastor Daniel. So I, so I open my magazine, have my earbuds in, and I'm reading. And evidently, this precious elderly saint didn't understand that posture because about 30 seconds later, she pokes me on the shoulder and I look over and she goes, and I was like, and she started to talk. And so I took out an earbud and she said, are you from Chicago? And I said, no, ma'am. I mean, if my mom was on the plane, she would have spanked me. I was being so rude. But I just, you know, sometimes you're like, I just can't. I just can't. I just, I just need a minute. I get back in that grumpy private posture. She still doesn't get it. 45 seconds later, same thing. She taps on my shoulder, take out the earbud, and she says, are you from Grand Rapids? And I said, no, ma'am. Went back. I mean, it's a wonder lightning didn't strike. Well, evidently, my hatefulness got the better of me because I fell asleep. So evidently, I was just knocked out by my own grumpiness. I fell asleep. I know I fell asleep because she woke me up. She woke me up because I had fallen asleep on the tray table. By now, we had taken off, and she was trying to slide my, my iPhone under my hanging down part. It had fallen off the tray table. She's trying to slide it under my hanging down part, and it kind of pinched me, and I look up, and I look up to see this precious concerned. Are y'all triplets? Gosh, y'all are darling. <laughs> mama, daddy, mama, congratulations. They're they are just beautiful. Sorry, y'all were just right there. So <laughs> I'll, I'll come back to you later. That was just like, Jesus, that was just ha like happy. So I'll go back to the plane. So she's, she, I can't even look at them now. They're so cute. Y'all should see them. So, so I look up and there's this countenance of this beautiful older woman filled with concern for me. So I took out my earbuds and I said, ma'am, I'm so sorry I was such a toot earlier. I'm, I'm sorry I was not kind. It's just been a really long week. I said, my name is Lisa. I'm not from Chicago or Grand Rapids. I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. I'm flying through Chicago, hopefully tonight, to get home to Nashville. I said, what's your name? And she said, well, my name is Agnes and I'm 83. <laughs> I was like, well, that's awesome. I said, where are you from, Miss Agnes? Are you from Grand Rapids or are you from Chicago? And she said, I'm from Grand Rapids. And I said, well, that's great. I said, why are you going to Chicago? And she went, I'm not going to Chicago. And you have to ask why. And I said, well, where are you going, Miss Agnes? And y'all, I may as well, as well have asked Santa where he hid the presents at the North Pole because... <laughs> Her face just lit up with a smile and she went, I'm going to Mumbai, India. And I was like, well, snap, that is not what I expected, you know? <laughs> but she could barely get on the plane and I said, Miss Agnes, why are you going to India? She took another deep breath. Y'all, her face just lit up like a Christmas tree and she said, Lisa, I'm going to India to tell people about Jesus. <laughs> And I was like, I'm sitting here about to be fried by the Holy Spirit for being hateful to such a sweet saint. I was so taken aback that this precious woman was going to India to share the hope of the gospel. And I said, Miss Agnes, you've got to tell me the rest of your story. So she starts telling me about how she didn't grow up in a Christian home. She became a believer right after she graduated from high school. She married her high school sweet, sweetheart. They were 17 and 18. She got pregnant pretty quickly. And in that spot, being a young woman, newly married and pregnant, she got a little anxious, wasn't sure if she could carry the weight of her own life. And a girl 
at work shared Jesus with her. And that's, that's when she fell into the arms of Jesus. Her husband, young man, said, I don't want anything to do with Jesus. Don't talk to me about Jesus. Don't make a, bring a Bible in our home. Don't invite me to church. And so she said she just started praying for her husband. Uh, her second pregnancy, they got pregnant with twins. Then her husband felt like he couldn't carry the weight of his own life, unbeknownst to Agnes. He started talking to a guy at work who knew Jesus. He ended up coming to Christ two years after her. And she said, you just wouldn't believe what God has done with our family. Family. She said that a couple of years after that, he came home from work and he said, honey, God has told me he wants me in the ministry. I believe he's called us to plan a church. So in their late 20s, they planted a church that I'm actually going to in a couple of weeks in downtown Grand Rapids. And she said, she said, Lisa, God has just so blessed us. But then she talked about when her husband was in his 40s and one of her sons had gotten married and they realized that grandchildren were probably in their future. She said they decided to do an addition on their home. And she said that um, her husband was killed in a building accident. Soon after that, one of her adult sons who had cerebral palsy, he also passed away. And she said that after their death, she fell into such a deep pit. She wasn't sure she'd ever have spiritual momentum again. She said she thought she'd probably stay in that pit of just depression and sorrow for the rest of her life. And she said after about a year, the Lord came to the edge of her pit. And he said, Agnes, I know you love Bill, but I'm the love of your life. And I know you love your son, but I'm actually your joy. And you've got a lot of life next, a lot of life left to live. So I want you to get out of that pit. And I, I'm just stunned listening to this woman. We're now both sharing ginger ale, you know. And she said, so I got out of the pit. And she said, did I tell you I was 83? And I said, yes, ma'am, you did. <laughs> and she said, Lisa, this is my 51st international mission trip I've taken since I was 45 years old and God pulled me out of that pit. She said, do you mind if I ask you a favor? And I said, Miss Agnes, you can ask me for anything, including a kidney at this point. <laughs> and she said, well, when I go to Mumbai tonight, she said, I'm not sure where I'm gonna stay. I, I don't have a place to live, to stay in Mumbai. And so would you pray that God would give me favor and I'd find a place to stay when I get there in 19 hours? And I was like, well, yes, ma'am, I'd love to pray for you. I said, but Miss Agnes, would it be all right if I prayed for you now? Not just later, but if I actually lay hands and pray for you now while we're on the plane? And she said, oh, that'd be lovely. And I laid my hands on this saint I had been such a jerk to 10 minutes before and leaned down to pray. And as I leaned down, all of a sudden I realized you could hear a pin drop on this plane. You know, a small plane, there are probably only 50 people on the plane, but I mean, you could have heard a pin drop. And I realized every single person has been listening to Miss Agnes' story. And so I prayed the super Pentecostal prayer. I got the whole gospel in the prayer. And, and we landed at Chicago here. When we landed, I got off with Miss Agnes to wait for them to bring us our suitcases on the, on the gateway. And um, as we were standing there waiting, 11 people, I counted, 11 people stopped and said, Miss Agnes, my name's so-and-so. I just want you to know I'll be praying for you too. Miss Agnes said, my name's so-and-so. I just want you to know I'll be praying for you too. By the time I got her to the international concourse, I was just about to miss my flight to Nashville. So I had to run the entire way, which is not always a good thing for women of a certain age because... <laughs> Sometimes you can get a little draft going. But anyway, I ran all the way to the Nashville gate and I wasn't a grumpy frequent flyer anymore. I just had this visceral, tangible model of that's what it looks like to keep running hard toward Jesus. That actually is what divine momentum looks like. This is a woman who's been through heck and back, lost a child, lost a husband, and she's still running hard toward Jesus. And it's not because Agnes is such a saint, it's because our God is so kind. When you talk about divine momentum, y'all, the, the scaffolding of divine momentum is God's faithfulness. He is faithful. He's faithful. You may lose a, a spouse, you may lose a breast. He is 
faithful and he's kind. He's always kind. We don't always see the kindness of God, but he is always kind. John chapter three, you know this story. I love John's gospel. We've got four gospels. The word gospel comes from the Greek word euangelion. It means the good news. The first three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic gospels. That's just a fancy word that means they're, they're similar in their literary format. Uh, John is called the Joanine gospel because his format is different. He, he doesn't start with his birth story like Luke does with the shepherds in the barn. He doesn't have any parables. His is different. And, uh, and, and pastor, I think you would love Jackie, his style, because he has kind of this counselor style. He's just, he's got such a relational tenant in his gospel. And y'all know this story. We're looking at two familiar stories briefly this morning. Now there was a man of the Pharisees. This is chapter three, verse one. A ruler of the Jews, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Okay, stick a finger in John three and turn backwards to Matthew chapter 10. It's about a quarter of an inch. Matthew chapter 10, because I wanna read something that y'all are probably familiar with if you grew up in church, even if you're a Christer and you just go to church on Christmas and Easter, you have probably heard this verse, Matthew chapter 10, verse 32. Now, if you have a, a, a Bible that has red in it, these are red letters. That means Jesus spoke this. Let me qualify that before I go any further. I heard a podcast recently and I heard a woman saying that if you were going to read the Bible, only read the red letters because that's the only time Jesus spoke. And I was like, oh, you precious, precious idiot. That's not the only time Jesus spoke. That's the only time incarnate Christ is recorded as speaking. Jesus has been there since the very beginning. And so don't just read the red letters in your Bible. That's when Jesus was recorded as speaking in his earthly ministry, but he's been speaking the whole time. And so, sorry, that was a caveat, but I needed to make it. So Matthew chapter 10, verse 32. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my father who is in heaven, but whoever denies me before, before men, I also will deny before my father who is in heaven. I grew up in a church, a great church, but several pastors in our church tradition were yellers and they had big neck veins. And this is one of the verses, I don't know, Daniel and Jackie, if y'all had one of these, but this is one of the verses they'd bellow. It would be the altar call. If y'all are new to Hope City, that's when we talk about Jesus loves you so much, he loves you so much, he loves you so much. And there's a point that you go, I can't make it by myself, I need a Messiah. I'm a hot mess, I need a Messiah. In, in old, old church tradition, sometimes they called that the altar call. It's time when you recognize, I need Jesus and he loves me. And he knows everything about me. He even knows when I'm in double spanked seasons and still he calls me beautiful. And that's when you give your heart to Jesus. Well, old school, sometimes pastors would say, and you've got to come up here to the front. And they'd spit and they'd have veins, at least in our church tradition they did. And then they'd say, and Jesus says, if you don't come up here in front of everybody, and acknowledge that you need Jesus, then he says he won't acknowledge you before his father. How many of y'all have heard that? Okay, it's in the Bible, but goodness gracious, y'all, there's so many things in the Bible we take out of context. And we turn these into these punitive things like God is holding up a phone book and ready to whack us over the head. And that's not the context. It's not the context at all. Jesus is talking to the apostles in Matthew chapter 10. He's saying, y'all been with me for three years We've been a transient team. We've, we've been spending the night outside under the stars having s'mores. You know me. You spent three years with me. You're the closest to me. In the future, things are gonna get tough. And when you don't have me in my incarnate body, I wanna encourage you to keep the faith. Hang on, don't equivocate. That's who he's talking to. He's talking to mature believers. He's not saying to a baby Christian, if you don't stand up and humiliate yourself, you're gonna have hives in heaven. That's not the context <laughs> of that verse. He's not saying that. Y'all, in, in John chapter three, Nicodemus is a big deal. He's a Pharisee, which means he's also a powerful political player. He drives a European car, lives in a gated community. He's a big <laughs> deal. It would have behooved Jesus. It would have really increased 
his status on social media to call Nicodemus out to say, hey buddy, you don't get to come in the dark. Come back tomorrow so everybody can see. So everybody can see that you're not completely fulfilled by the law. So everybody can see you're still hungry for a relationship. Come back then and we'll insta story it because I want to prove that the religious system doesn't work, that you need a relationship with me. He doesn't do that. It says he lets Nicodemus come at night. Sometimes we miss these little moments of mercy in scripture. And that's what, what kind of adds us taking it out of context. I believe our lack of momentum is largely due to our biblical illiteracy. If we actually spend as much time in this book as we do on Twitter or TikTok or Instagram, and I'm not dissing that, just saying that because I have no rhythm, so there's a root of bitterness there. Can't do TikTok, people would be scarred for life. But y'all, if we actually studied this, if we marinated in this, and you begin to see, oh my goodness, I kind of pictured him there as having a unibrowed expression, being mad at his people. Oh my goodness, that was merciful you'd begin to see again and again and again, our momentum, sometimes it's he's carrying us on our worst day. He's not an angry God. He's a merciful God. He lets Nick come at night. Y'all see what I did there? I thought that was cute. So he lets Nicodemus come at night. They have this discussion about theology. And then we get to the end of this discussion about theology. He talks to him about, you've got to be born again. Nick says, my mom had an epidural. That's weird. How do I get back in the womb? They have this discussion back and forth. Jesus doesn't belittle him. Jesus is not condescending. They get to the end of this discussion. And Jesus says, no one has ascended, this is verse 13 of chapter three, into heaven except him who descended from heaven, the son of man, me. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up that whosoever believes in him may have eternal life. Now, those of y'all who who love the Old Testament, you may remember in the book of Numbers, that's after God rescued his people out of captivity in Egypt. And then they spent this time wandering in the wilderness. Do y'all remember that? They wandered in the wilderness for about 40 years, even though, it should have been only 11 days if they had taken the direct GPS route. So they were just like us. They are kind of prone to wander. They're in the wilderness for a long time. Well, during that wilderness wandering season, God's people were not perfectly faithful. Their momentum was not always straight toward Jehovah. They got distracted. So if you're in a prodigal season, don't be discouraged. You are not the only one to wander away from God. There may be discipline. You won't have peace when you're not close to God. You just won't. That's the greatest discipline of all is having to drink wine or take an Ambien because you just can't sleep at night because so many things are running through your head. God has designed us for peace. God has designed us for joy. People who go, I'm fine, I'm fine. I love my life. Well, I always think me thinks that doth protest too much because you don't look like you're loving your life so much. You look like you're, you're miserable. He's designed us for intimacy with him. When you step away from that intimacy, there's no peace. There's no lasting joy outside of that. God's people were wandering during that season. They were wandering so far that they were literally wandering into the literal wilderness and they were getting bitten by rattlesnakes, by vipers. If you ever have a privilege to go to Israel, you'll find it's a very arid place. And so some of them were dying from snake bite. The Bible is not a fable, y'all. These are real people, real stories, real stuff, just like us. And they begin to grieve. I I lost my kid. I lost my uncle. They got bitten by a snake. And God says, you are not trusting me as your God. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to establish basically an altar in the middle of camp. And we're going to build a pole. We're going to go get a pole from Home Depot. And then we're going to work with a metal artisan on Etsy. And they're going to make a bronze snake. This is in the Bible. People tell me it's boring. I'm like, this is better than Jerry Springer. We're gonna make a bronze snake. We're gonna put that on top of this pole. And whenever any of my people get bitten by a snake, all they have to do is glance at that metal bronze snake on top of that pole because by doing that, tangibly what they're saying is, I believe God can take care of me. I'm I'm just human. If I get bitten by a poisonous snake, it's gonna have a physical effect. But I believe that even in the natural, our God can work out a miracle. I trust my God, I trust him to protect me. So when I look at that bronze snake, 
What I'm effectively doing is I'm proving that I trust in God. That's, that's in the book of Numbers. That's way before you get to, to John's gospel. But Jesus is so kind. Our God is so personal. He knows Nick knows that story. Nick is a good Jewish boy. He had Nike posters of Moses when he was growing up in his bedroom. He knows Nicodemus knows that story. And he says, Nick, I know you don't get this theology. I love you so much. I'm gonna put the cookies on the lower shelf. Remember, remember during the wilderness, remember the whole Etsy snake thing? And Nick is like, oh yeah, I remember that. My granddad used to love to tell me that story. He goes, well, basically that was pointing to me because I'm gonna be lifted up on a cross. And if you turn to me and say, that's my hope, you'll be saved. I know it's confusing when we talk about being born again. Nick, you've gotta look to me. You've gotta look. He makes it plain for Nicodemus. Doesn't humiliate him, is not condescending to him. He has a conversation with him. And then right after this encounter with Nick, we get what is arguably the most famous verse in all of scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So for God so loved the world, that little tiny word in English comes from one word in the Greek, it's hutos. It's an amplification of the word. In other words, Jesus is telling Nick and the woman who comes behind Nick, God doesn't love you a little. God doesn't love you just a little bit based on your capacity or your behavior. God so loves you. Y'all, if we could get the so. If we could get the so, it would change everything. He doesn't love you a little. He's not disappointed in you. He doesn't turn his back on you when your momentum stops because you're stuck or because there's a barrier. He gets behind you and picks you up and carries you to a new place when you had no capacity to get there on your own. That's called grace. Right after being with Nick, who was arguably at the top of the continuum of culture. He's a brilliant man, he's a powerful man, he's a successful man. He has an encounter with someone who you could say is the opposite end of the continuum. And you know her story, John chapter four, the woman at the well. And she's often castigated as being a sleazy woman. That's not even true, y'all. New Testament scholars, modern New Testament scholars, I should qualify it one more time and say conservative, modern New Testament scholars, because like Pastor Jackie and like Pastor Daniel and like all of the leadership here at Hope City, I believe scripture is true from cover to cover. We live in a culture that loves to cut and paste and we throw things on Instagram and that's not even God's intent. This is redemptive from cover to cover. I love God's word because at its core, it's a love story. He, he meets with this woman who we've castigated as sleazy because we're told she was married five times and she was living with a man who wasn't her husband. If you get culture from the first century, marriage was a huge deal for a man to give a woman a certificate of marriage had all kinds of legal ramifications. And so the fact that this woman was divorced, do you know what age women married in the first century? Y'all can talk back, I'm not your pastor. About 12. 12 is the median age of marriage in the first century. Do you know what the average age was of a bridegroom in the first century? 35. So you've got a little girl my daughter's age, my little girl just turned 13, so you've got a seventh grader, and you've got a 35-year-old man. And she marries him, and usually their daddies would put them together because it had to do with a business arrangement. And that little girl thinks, I don't know this guy, and I'm kind of scared of what's gonna happen on the wedding night, but he's gonna take care of me for the rest of my life. Do you know what the common reason was, most common reason for divorce in the first century? infertility. And so we don't know definitively, but it's very likely that this woman at the well suffered from infertility. Here's where we get the story wrong. It's a huge deal that four additional men after her first husband would vault over the hurdle of culture and say, I'm going to hand her a legal document of marriage because she's so beautiful and so kind and so compelling, she's worth the risk. We've made her sleazy, there's no way. History doesn't support that. 
She was not sleazy. She was broken. She was humiliated. She was kicked to the curb five times by men she thought, maybe he'll stay. Maybe he'll stay with me. Five different men kick her to the curb legally. She's at the well in the heat of the day. You know this story. She's there because she don't want the rest of the town to gossip about her. They're gossiping about her, but she probably didn't do anything except she likely wasn't able to carry a child. And after talking to Nicodemus and being so kind to Nicodemus, you see this compassion accessibility that is miraculous. He says, I'd like to get a drink of water from you. First of all, the beginning of John 4, it says he had to go to Samaria. We read that as a geographical detail, y'all. It's not a geographical detail. It points to his compassion. He didn't have to. Other Jewish rabbis didn't go through Samaria because Samaritans are, it's a people group that are half Jewish, half Assyrian. Happened after, after there was this huge war and the northern part of Israel is swept away by the Assyrians and just a few women are left in order to further subjugate the Jews. The Assyrian warlords came in and used them basically as, as human slaves. And they had kids with them. And those kids were half Jewish, half Assyrian, despised by their culture, called Samaritans. My daughter is from Haiti. You got the most beautiful black skin you've ever seen. I became a mom through the miracle of adoption. My daughter, Missy, and I live an hour north of where the KKK started. You better bet we've had some people who say ugly things because my daughter is so much prettier than their kids. <laughs> we've had people say things to us because they don't think a, a pale mama should be with a beautiful black daughter. I can only imagine the judgment this woman at the well had experienced, not just because five men have kicked her to the curb, but she's a Samaritan. So Jews considered her to be a half-breed. Jesus didn't have to go through Samaria because that's where GPS directed him. He had to because of his heart for his people. It's not a geographical detail. It's a, a facet of the heart of God for his people. He had to go through Samaria because he knew he'd find there. And he engages with this woman and y'all know the story. They have a conversation about theology. And he says, in the future, people will worship me in spirit and in truth. That word worship in John 4 comes from one word in the Greek. It's proskuneo. It's a word translated worship in, in the gospels. He says, I want you to proskuneo me to this woman. When you get this word, it'll just slay you. Pros means to move forward. Do you know what kinuo means? Some of y'all Greek scholars, do you remember it? It means to kiss. Stop and think. She's been kicked to the curb five times by men who said she wasn't good enough, starting from the time she was in the seventh grade. Kicked to the curb. Kissed a lot of frogs, hoping to find a prince. And Jesus has to engage with her. And he says, if you'll move toward me with your kisses, you won't be thirsty for affection anymore. I know you're desperate for unconditional love. You'll find that in me. Nicodemus, I know you're desperate for peace. You'll find that in me. I know y'all don't understand it. I'll reveal myself in a way that you can't miss it. You can't miss it. I lost an adoption at the 11th hour, four days before I was supposed to bring the baby home. I wasn't sure I'd be able to peel my heart back up off the pavement. Two weeks after I lost the adoption, a friend called and said, Lisa, I was in the waiting room of a hospital in Haiti after one of the young moms died of AIDS and she left behind a two-year-old. And the doctors have told us this little girl will die in the next two months if somebody, really anybody, from a first world country doesn't step in to her story. And she said, as I was sitting there, the Lord spoke to me as clear as I've ever heard the Lord. I hadn't talked to this girl in years. We used to be in a Bible study before. And she said, God said, Lisa Harper is supposed to be this, this girl's mom. And she said, I know like I know my name, I'm supposed to call you. And she said, I know you're still grieving this first adoption loss, but would you be willing to pray 
about stepping into the story of this little girl named Missy. And I said, nope. I said, I've been praying about this for 30 years. Sign me up. And I got off the phone and I said a word that's not in the Bible. Because <laughs> I didn't know how to walk that, y'all. I didn't know how to have the momentum to move toward a little girl in Haiti. All I knew was that my God has always been good. My God has carried me when I couldn't walk. My God has held me when everybody else abandoned me. My God has always revealed himself to me in a way that even my dinky mind, I can understand. That's the key to us moving toward God. It's not based on our character and it's not based on our capacity. It's rooted in his compassion. He loves you. He will make a way where there seems to be no way. Let me ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I apologize that that sounds bossy and religious. I don't mean to come across as quite so bossy, but I want you to know you're safe, especially those of you who took the shuttle here for the very first time. This is your first time at Hope City. I know you were disappointed when Pastor Daniel didn't get up to preach. I apologize for that too. I wanted to hear him as well. Keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed because I wanna be honest in these last few moments we have together. If you are in a really difficult season, we're talking about momentum and you may think, I'm not even sure I'll ever be able to walk again. I just feel like my heart and my spirit is crushed. I'm not just stuck, I'm broken, absolute broken. I feel paralyzed by heartache. Nobody's looking around. Pastor Daniel and Pastor Jackie and I are the only ones with our eyes open. If you feel absolutely stuck, would you just raise your hand? Pastor Daniel, And Pastor Jackie are gonna effectively take you by the hand and lead you to Jesus. Y'all, I promise, he's not mad at you. I've been stuck so many times. I've been stuck this week. We had a premature death in our family and a cancer diagnosis and feel like my heart has been run over by a Mack truck. He's not mad at you if you're stuck. He does have mercy for you. He's a good God. He's a compassionate God. Would you raise your hands back up? Because I want Pastor Daniel and Pastor Jackie to see the saints. They have the privilege of praying with and for this morning. If you didn't raise your hand the first time and you just need help this morning, You're not even sure. You're not even sure what to ask for. You just can't carry the weight of your own life by yourself right now. Raise your hands high enough that they can see you. Put your hands down. Can we stand as a church family? God, we thank you that the answer begins with and always ends with you, Jesus. God, as we've been listening today, there's been a stirring in our hearts. Those that lifted their hands and said, I feel I feel stuck. God, I pray for a peace that overshadows them. I pray for a hope that only you can give. I pray for a Nehemiah 8:10 joy that becomes their strength today. That when they leave, God, they can brag and boast that I walked in one way. I've been putting a band-aid where I needed stitches. Today's the day that I need Jesus to show up and restore hope again and peace again. I need freedom. So God, today I thank you for your presence. Lord, we just ask in the name of Jesus for every person that lifted their hand that you would let them feel seen right where they stand. God, every piece of the the trial that they're in the middle of, God, every piece of the journey that they're on that feels painful, that feels hard, that feels lonely, that feels unheard. God, I ask that every person 
that felt willing to lift their hand and say, I feel stuck right here. God, I pray that they would feel seen by you and that that peace that passes all understanding, God, would wash over them right now. And while they may not have an answer to the need that they are in the midst of right this moment, they know that they know the one with the answer. And I pray that that is more than enough for the peace to take root and the fear to start to dissipate. And I pray that you would fill them with hope, fill them with faith in the knowing that you are for them. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. You put your hands down if you had it lifted, just for a moment, with every eye closed, across all of our locations here at West Houston, Katie Cinco, our, our Woodlands, maybe you're watching online, maybe you stumbled upon the replay of this moment, maybe you're watching online right now, maybe you've been listening today and you said, Daniel, that entire message by Lisa, it was just stirring in me. I felt a tug in my heart. And here's the truth. I don't know Jesus as my Savior. I don't have momentum in my life because I've been getting in the way. Or maybe you come from the old mindset that God's mad at you. Maybe you've made so many mistakes, you would say, why would he even accept me? truth is God's not mad at you. He's actually madly in love with you. He already paid every mistake you've made, anything you're in the middle of, anything you'll ever do. He hung on a dead tree and said, I'm going to do this because she's valuable. I'm going to do this because he's worth it. I'm going to do this because I don't see them as damaged goods or fragile. Every eye closed, nobody looking around for just a moment. Maybe you're here and you say, Daniel, the entire service, something in my heart was convincing me of the fact that there's more to life than the way I've been living it. And from today on, I'm gonna make a choice to, to walk with Jesus because the truth is, I know that he has been pursuing me. Maybe the second invitation, you say, Daniel, here's the truth. I used to walk with Jesus and I fell away. Today's the day I wanna rededicate my life. I'm not satisfied. Honestly, I've been living reckless, caught up in the prodigal life, and today's the day I want to rededicate my life. The 21st of August, 2022, I want to leave marked again by his presence. Whether you're one of the two invitations, I want to know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I want to rededicate my life. Everybody at every campus watching online, you can say yes to Jesus. Our team will help you. I'm going to count to three. And if you're here today and you say, I want to make my life, I want to commit my life, I want to pursue Jesus. When I hit three, I want you to lift up your hand. One, you're talking to me. Two, today's my day. Three, lift up your hand. I'm looking all over the room. I see you, 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 hand, hand, hand. I see you, I see you, I see you. Come on, Hope City. I see you, I see you in the back. I see you here and here and over there. The two over here. I see you over here. Come on, we can do better than that. Come on, a bunch of people across every location said you're talking about me today. So this is what we're gonna do. We're all gonna pray from our team, our staff, dream team, Hope City Worship. We're all gonna say this prayer. So to anyone who lifted their hand, they won't feel uncomfortable today. Come on, everybody pray this prayer. Say, Jesus, it's me. I've been living for me and it's just not working. From today on, I choose to live for you. I repent for every mistake, all my issues and every sin. I ask for your forgiveness. I believe that you hung on that cross for my life, even though I didn't deserve it. You did it because you said that my life was worth it. Then you rose again on the third day so that I could walk in freedom. And I'm grateful for that promise. I confess you now as my Father, my Savior, and my Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, Hope City, across every campus. Can we celebrate every person that said, today's my day.